This is Martin. Martin is on the lights. This is Matt. Matt is on the music buttons. And I am Ruth, and I have the projector. <laughs> <laughs> everything that you just saw, everything that we do here tonight, is done with JavaScript. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know, right? Uh, so before we start actually giving you a show, we thought what we'd do is just take you through, very briefly, every single aspect of what you just saw. So. Grab a drink. I assume you've got drinks outside and some water. That's fine. Relax and enjoy the show. And I'm supposed to be starting. <laughs> oh, <laughs> My thing's on the screen. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, sweet. It's going to be fine. Right. So, yeah, as you may have gathered, I make music and I use computers to do that. However, um, this, I'm getting hyped now. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even drunk anything yet. Anyway. OK, all right, sorry. I'm, I'm, I just, we, yeah, we're good, we're good. OK, all right. So I got sick of making music with computers, and I decided to make software to make music with computers. And I did it with JavaScript, because JavaScript is a thing I know. Um, but I know what you're thinking. Today I'm going to show you a super simple turkey recipe that gives you the most perfect, delicious bird every time. We'll start by tossing out the giblets, but we'll keep the neck, we'll be using that. Now for the stuffing. We'll need one cup of celery, one cup of carrots, an axe, and a dog. Why would you do that? Why on earth? <laughs> what? Anyway, I have a very good reason. Basically, playing computer music is really weird. It's, it's a strange thing. So, most of my life, the last 10 years, no, not most of my life, most of the last 10 years, I have been using computers to make music in my bedroom. And going from composing stuff in a timeline, to actually trying to play a gig in front of people. It's something that every, I think pretty much anyone that's doing modern music these days faces, but particularly people that are doing entirely computer-based music, where they're not actually playing any instruments themselves. They're just putting little dots on a screen and they're tweaking parameters. And it's just, it's just really strange for us to try and play live. And compared to someone like uh, a guitarist, because what they're doing on the album is really similar to what they're doing on stage. They're just playing the guitar. And so if they're on stage, they play the guitar, and people are like, woohoo. And if they're on the album, then the recording engineer is like, do that again. But otherwise, it's pretty much the same. So what are my options as a musician, if I want, as a, as a computer musician, if I want to actually play my stuff for real to an audience? Well, one of them is I could just get some real musicians to play everything for me, and I could be like the conductor or something. And there are a lot of uh, really cool electronic bands that do that. So on the album, it's just like one guy doing everything, or one gal. But in the stage, they start getting some guy on the drums, and someone else on the guitar, and, and someone on the synths, and someone on the crazy stuff. And that's kind of cool. But I think you kind of get a, different, a completely different vibe from that. And in some ways, it's kind of better. I mean, why, why are we even doing computer music, which is just play real instruments? But 
The next option, of course, is you can DJ it. And this is more like exhibiting your work as a musical artist. So rather than uh, just, um, rather than trying to like recreate everything on stage, it's like, you know, a painter isn't gonna paint something every gallery. It's, they, they painted this thing in, the, in their beautiful little mansion somewhere up on a hill, and then they've shifted all this stuff into a beautiful space that you can come view their painting. And so I think DJs are kind of doing that. And this is my favorite example. Um, Darude. Welcome this gentleman to the stage. Please give it up for Darude. So everyone is so hyped to see this amazing musician perform. They've paid thousands of dollars and uh, flew on miles or kilometers. And here he comes, it's so cool. This is Darude. Darude is like, the most amazing electronic artist of all time. And he's coming up on stage. And what does he do? Are you ready for it? He pushes play. And the rest of this is just him going hype. And lots of light show. So Martin has a really useful role for Daru. <laughs> But that is not what I wanted to do, for obvious reasons, maybe, to some people. So, really, I was only left with one other option, which is I actually have to play everything myself. Uh, and I have, and well, I mean, I'm not really going to show you the music that I've been, that I used to make, because it's completely changed since I started trying to play everything myself. But, uh, yeah, it's... If you want to find out about that story, you should look at my talk I gave last year at JSConf. Was anyone here at last JSConf? Yeah, cool, some people. Yeah, you should look it up, because I'm going to explain what I'm actually doing. So all I'm going to do now is I'm actually just going to show you uh, what my JavaScript software does. So, oops, I didn't get my web camera working. Um, are we able to, oh, we have, yeah. Can you get a close-up of my hands? Sweet. So. I can just play sounds. I've got a bunch of different instruments. But I can also play perfectly in time with the beat. And then I can loop whatever I've just done. and then I can just build up whole songs doing those things. And so all of these different colors represent different sounds that I can trigger at any moment that I want to. And then I can have as many different um, things loaded and I can mix between them. Kind of like a, somewhere between a DJ and a musician. Yeah, so that's pretty much how this all works. So I'm gonna be doing this for another hour after this, um, but without talking, it's gonna be much better. Thank you very much, Matt. So what you're saying is you make music with JavaScript. I do. That's amazing, because I need music. Really? Yeah. I'm the VJ, right? You what now? What is a VJ? I know, I get this question a lot. So I, I put visuals to music. That, that's what a VJ is. Um, I might need a llama in a minute. So how out of the audience? <laughs> I'm waiting for Matt to be ready. Yeah? OK, cool. <laughs> Who remembers this? Winner. Winner. It really whips the lot of ass. Thank you very much, Ooh. yes. <laughs> the best. Oh. <laughs> I, I, honestly, I'm taking that DJ everywhere with me from now on. Uh, <laughs> best MP3 player of all time, right? Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a really, really light MP3 player for when we actually kept MP3s on hard drives. Uh, but this wasn't the best thing about Winamp, this lovely piece of software. No, 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 no. The best thing about Winamp was this. 
the visualization engine. Who remembers that? So this was actually a part of the software. So you could fire this up, and it would show you visualizations that went in time with the music. This is probably the biggest influence of any VJ of my generation. We used to sit there in our teenage years and just watch it, and be like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could make this? <laughs> Funnily enough, we can in a browser, right? So the first thing you need to create visuals in a, in a browser is to analyze the sound. So we can do that with the Web Audio API. It has an analyzer node. That's really cool. So this is just a quick example of what we can do. This is mostly sort of analyzing my voice now. It's a little bit of latency, because I'm running it within the slides. So we just grab the analyzer node from the Web Audio API. And all we're doing, all we get back is an array of frequency velocities. Right? So frequencies, that's low sounds to high sounds. And all it's doing is telling us what volume those frequencies are at any given time. So we can take that data, and it's just numbers. We can just take that data and do whatever we want with it. And we can do that within a browser. So we can use a whole bunch of sort of browser features. So we can do stuff on the DOM. We can do stuff on Canvas. We can, we can do stuff with WebGL. We can do whatever we want. We can use new features. So one of the visuals we saw at the beginning uses CSS blends and filters, which is nice. These lovely speakers here. You saw some of them earlier. That's all blend modes. That was fun building that. It's a little bit, it's a little bit cranky every now and again, but it was, it was fun building it. Other things like custom properties, right? So this is a fun one. This is JavaScript all up in your CSS. So what you can do is you can take one of the frequency values, pass it into a custom property, which is basically a CSS variable, and pass it back into your CSS, right? So we can do that here. We're using the get byte frequency data. So our frequency data here is our frequency data array. And then we're just doing document, dot, document element, dot style, set property. And then the level there, that's my CSS variable. And I'm just passing that data back into my CSS. So I can change anything in the browser CSS-wise with that frequency data. So I can, not only can I do it in my JavaScript, I can do it in my CSS as well. That's fun. So it's pretty, it's pretty easy to make visuals. I'm sure we can all code, right? If you want to see more of my visuals, I've been doing Code Vember this month. So if you go on CodePen and, and look me up, you'll see a whole bunch of experiments that I've been doing. And I've been trying to do them in different ways as well, whether that's normal DOM elements, like looping over sort of eye elements and changing sizes, which is the spectrum you saw earlier, or trying new things out, like using d3.js. That's a really, really nice library to use for taking the data and manipulating it and doing things with it. Um, but how do we control it? Web MIDI API, right? So one of my favorite things to talk about. You say MIDI to somebody, and everybody just assumes it's bleepy electronic music. I am going to, I am going to break your brains. It is not even sound. MIDI is a data protocol. It came about in the 80s when a bunch of industry experts and music manufacturers got together. And they said, we've got all these amazing electronic instruments these days, and they've got no way to talk to each other. And they went, let's make, let, let's make a protocol. So they did. We are all running MIDI controllers here, all three of us. Only one of them is being used to make sounds. We're all, like, he's using one to control lights with, which is pretty brilliant. <laughs> um, this, this is a MIDI-enabled instrument. So this has onboard audio, right? We pretty much steam one of these. This is a keyboard. You play it, it plays sounds. It also sends MIDI data. So you can plug this into your computer, and it will send MIDI data. Um, this, this is a controller. This is what we're using. So it does the same thing. It sends MIDI data, but it doesn't have any onboard audio. So you can just plug it into your laptop. You run the web MIDI API. You're basically getting numbers. So this is my MIDI controller. I've got a little one. They've got big ones. This is my handbag MIDI controller. Um, and if we get the camera over here so you can see what we're, I'm doing, can I point it that way? What, what should happen, let's say this happens, is when I crossfade using the bottom slider here, it will fade from one visual into the other visual. There's a tiny bit of latency. But yeah, we're going from the lovely opening for JS Asia into the speakers and back again. And all I'm doing is just picking up on the numbers and making sure that happens. Let me make it go back again. There you go. Thank you. So MIDI is a great data protocol. And it actually influenced other things, like a lighting protocol, which is DMX, which I believe Martin is using. I am, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just a 
bit of background information. If you, uh, so there's this protocol called DMX, which is basically used by any sort of professional lighting equipment. But if you have a, have a look at uh, how these lights are normally operated, they're huge custom-made computers that are uh, terribly expensive. I couldn't afford one. Um, so I, I, I look like mm, I can build something like that myself. So this is uh, one of the two media interfaces, uh, not, not media, DMX, uh, DMX interfaces that I'm using. Uh, to control all the lights here in this venue. Um, so um, how DMX works is uh, pretty simple. So um, DMX has uh, 512 channels, hence the name DMX 512. Um, and all each of these channels is uh, basically just a one byte number. <coughs> And in DMX, there's always only one sender, and uh, all the other devices are receivers. Um, there's uh, something uh, I call device mapping happening, which means that every device needs to know which of these uh, 512 channels uh, it should read from a stream of uh, 512 bytes. So um, I define a start address for each device, uh, which is the first address it will read, and then the menu says, for instance, a device will read like four channels for different functions. Or maybe just one channel if it's uh, just a lamp that I can dim or switch on and off or something like that. But um, the most annoying thing about DMX is how it's implemented, because every manufacturer does completely different things with it. So there are, there are sometimes uh, you can control the color with 16-bit values uh, using two channels. Sometimes it's just 8-bit uh, value. Uh, so it's uh, kind of horrible to just uh, manipulate these byte arrays manually. However, um, if we look at uh, something like this, this is basically DMX translated to JavaScript. So I have an unsigned int array with 512 bytes. and. Uh, this uh, device data would be a slice of that array that the device sees. Uh, in this case, starting at address 42, um, obviously. Um, and uh, yeah, the array index is zero based. DMX addresses are always one based. Um, and so, um, for instance, some device mapping could look like this, that I have uh, one channel that controls the brightness um, and three channels that control a uh, uh, color value. But however, um, most devices, uh, especially those that we have here, are not that simple. So um, the uh, spotlights we have uh, here in the venue have like 20 stepper motors and all sorts of uh, really complex stuff going on. So um, they are moving head spotlights like you see in a picture. So you can control with pan and tilt, you can control the motion. Then there's uh, the brightness and the color value. The color value is not RGB, but it is uh, in CMY color mixing. Uh, then we have uh, configurable lenses, so I can move both lenses uh, back and forth, uh, so I can have uh, have parameters like zoom and focus. And then there are special beam shaping effects and uh, a lot of more stuff. So uh, in total, there's 27 channels uh, for each of these devices. In order to manage that, I uh, wrote this library uh, called 512. And I did that for last year's JSConf EU, where it was first presented, which is uh, basically just a really neat abstraction library uh, for this uh, DMX512 protocol. Code looks like this. So I have uh, a DMX device. The first parameter is an address. Um, the second parameter is a list of all the parameters that device accepts. Uh, I left them out because it's usually a really, really long list. And uh, yeah, and, uh, once I have this device, I can just assign values to a property, so, which is uh, quite amazing what uh, define property allows me to do there. There are also things, uh, automatic conversion from degrees to the internal system of, of the mo uh, moving heads, or uh, even every CSS color value is automatically translated into CMY color format. So um, I wanted to do some light show with it. So the simplest way would be so I, I have uh, some some sort of interval function, and uh, yeah, I can I can just use something like uh, trigonom trigonometric functions. Uh, I hate this word. <laughs> uh, just to, to control the motion. And, and that would give me a smooth motion. But um, 
controlling this with something like these MIDI, MIDI controllers here and uh, constantly switching and not knowing how exactly the lights are layouted in the venue, I would have magic numbers everywhere. So I decided to go a different route and uh, rewrote that code uh, so it looked like this. So um, you, might, you might notice what I did there. Um, I, those are still the same properties, but it's just CSS syntax, which is really very much easier to write. Um, but yeah, how, how could that even work? So um, the first thing I did was um, I, I have some HTML, so I have something that I can style. Um, which looks like this. So I have devices, I have the device root, and uh, no browser, uh, oh, I didn't test, uh, it's just Chrome, uh, <laughs> didn't complain uh, about there being some unknown tags. I could still style them as I liked. Uh, so I have these channel numbers. So one colon is the, this is the interface number, uh, so which of these two interfaces will handle this data. The second one is the channel number. And then I have some classes and uh, stuff that I can use when writing that CSS. And then there is a, a little bit of JavaScript. Um, so I can just uh, query all these device nodes from, from the document. And then I can use get computed style, doing this repeatedly in an animation loop. So I can always get the uh, current value of all of my uh, custom properties that I just made up. And uh, then I just need to decode what is in the style, so uh, from string to number conversion, stuff like that, and uh, write it out uh, using the DMX interfaces. But there's one problem with that. Um, because if I just write pan colon zero degrees, um, the browser will just say, ah, nah, that's invalid CSS. I don't have that in computed style. So um, I had to do a little trick which is using custom properties. Uh, so uh, color is something the browser knows, um, and animation is something the browser knows, but everything else just gets the pro custom property so I can read out the values. But I don't know if, if you've been here yesterday's talk by Lea Veru. Um, custom properties and animations don't mix. So there's a proposal for that, and I would have hoped I have a working implementation of that now here, but it uh, didn't show up. So I needed a hack for that. And this is this one. So I, I figured I can just use any animatable CSS property. And just uh, instead of writing pan, I can write left. And instead of writing tilt, I write right. And instead of brightness, I could write top, or all these margins, or all this uh, border radius. And any, any animatable CSS property would work for this. So I have a, a huge repository of uh, properties that I could animate instead of my own custom properties. So the hack is this. I pass all the CSS I write, um, uh, and then modify the AST so I can uh, add these custom properties and add animation fallbacks. Uh, then finally reassemble it into a CSS source code and inject it into the browser. And finally, this animation loop that, I shown, that I've shown you, get computed style, will always give me the current value of all those animations. And to prove this, this is um, the code that has been running all the time. Um, so we have, for instance, uh, uh, this is a, a whole lot of uh, CSS that I wrote in the last day. But um, so I have these abbreviations like QP for the quantum profile and uh, QW for the um, uh, quantum wash lights. And I can now just go ahead and be like, uh, nah, QW. And let's say uh, brightness one. So this will be full brightness. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and it gets even brighter. Nah. This? Ah. I, I, I know, I know, I know, no. Problem is, I'm missing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's been, been being overridden. But, and here I can also show you that this is actually happening right in my browser. So here's this device root, and I can now just look at this here and 
So which one, the stage floor, stage floor is interesting. Let's look at this one. Ah. So come up. Um, and here you see all these, uh, all this generated style. So I have this uh, color white here, which is now overridden somewhere here. And I believe I should be able, uh, oh, but those aren't on. Okay. So I can also just go ahead and write directly into my dev tools additional CSS for all these, uh, for all these devices. Anyway. <laughs> so this was a reload, um, and now it's stuck here. Anyway, okay, this is better. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I guess I guess <laughs> I'm so cool. Wow. <laughs> so this is uh, what I what I will be presenting with uh, for the for the next uh, hours, and uh, the final thing what I need to tell you is. This thing will do nothing else than toggling CSS classes on that uh, devices element in the top. So if I just press these buttons, you see devices updates the style, and animations start and stop and move and so on. Right, that was my part. Ruth. That's amazing. <laughs> if you haven't discovered MIDI controllers as hardware enabling your browser, you, you really need to do that. You press buttons, things change. It's amazing. <laughs> Would you like to help us make a song, make a track? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. OK, great. Let's do that. All right, so uh, I have a audio recorder here in my hand. And you guys have voices, and you have feet, and you have hands. And you can whack all those things together, and we'll see what happens. Not each other, though, OK? Um, just adjust the level here. Can I just get everyone to yell out JavaScript on the count of three? One, two, three. JavaScript! Yeah, I think it worked. JavaScript! That's good enough. <laughs> that was just the warm up. What is with the. Here we go. OK. Um, can I get everyone to, on the count of three, to stomp their foot? I know it sounds unusual, but it makes a very good stand and kick drum. Uh, hang on. OK. One, two, three. <laughs> nice. It's all right. <laughs> we, can, we can make it better, though. That's all right. OK, can I get everyone to, on the count of three, to clap? One, two, three. <laughs> That's all right. OK, now let's do some, uh, let's, make a, let's make some melody here. Anyone got a beautiful singing voice? <laughs> or just a voice is good enough. <laughs> Voices. So I'm creating a new chunk, which I'm going to drop on my launch pad. Um, as you can see on the screen there, these here, they cor correspond to my actual hardware. So I'm just saying on this particular part, x, y coordinates, I want this particular sound. And so now I'm going to record something into it. Whoops. So I'll just show you what it's like for a start. La. Whoops. <laughs> oh, I don't even need you. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's let's record. Let's record everyone. That'd be great. So let's let's all make the same pitch if we can try. Anyway, we can have a few goes at it. So we'll go for a. Um, actually, just copy this. OK, you ready? One, two, three. Oh. Oh. That'll do.
get this mic off, please? Awesome. Big hands again for Martin, Ruth and Matt and then enjoy your drinks and have a great life, cheers.